Hi speed cubers! So have you ever wondered why a 4x4 Rubik's Cube can have OLL and PLL parity, but a 3x3 cannot? Well, I just found this old class folder from January 2016, that's when I was a freshman at Stanford, where I tried to explain the issue. By pure coincidence, the last modified date is the exact same day I did my first face reveal on YouTube ever. This Sony Vegas file is from almost 9 years ago, so let's hear what 18 year old me had to say about parody. I know I haven't been posting here for a while. I've been busy with college and my other YouTube channel, KH. Also, I'm a bit congested right now, so sorry about that. But today, in my group theory class, the instructor was talking about how any permutation of objects can either be reached by only an even number of swaps or by only an odd number of swaps, never both. There were all these formulas on the board and the other students were writing them down. That's totally fine. But the questions other students asked gave me the impression that all these complex equations were preventing them from understanding it intuitively. I'm not against equations. I just think that when you can learn a concept without memorizing a bunch of symbols, you can understand that concept at a much deeper level. So the theorem was, any permutation of objects can either be reached by only an even number of swaps or by only an odd number of swaps, never both. In other words, if you're applying pairs of swaps at once, you can't get from the realm of cases with an even number of swaps to the realm of cases with an odd number of swaps. Okay, future carry here. Here's an easier way to understand even and odd permutations. Every time you swap any two elements, you'll always alternate between being in an even permutation and an odd permutation, or odd to an even. You can never swap two elements and stay on the same side of this line. So it follows that when you do a pair of swaps, that's what I mentioned back in 2016, you'll always stay on the same side after the pair, because you go boop boop, Boop, boop. Any speed cuber will know this by heart. Understanding 4x4 and square 1 parity problems relies on this fundamental fact. You can never do a single swap. But why is this? Can we explain this without complex equations? Definitely. Let's take an arbitrary set of elements. It doesn't matter how many. I'm going to use an arrow to say, this point is going to go here. So a swap, aka a two cycle or transposition, looks like this. Elements that don't move are 1 cycles, and they look like this. Cycles can also be much longer and look like this. What if I want to swap two elements that are already pointing somewhere? Easy. Just swap the endpoints of their arrows. Makes sense, doesn't it? And by the way, swapping two fixed points is also the same idea, just that the arrows originally pointed at themselves. Imagine this set of dots. Let's write the size, aka order, of each cycle. Clearly, no matter what cycles we draw on these dots, the sum of the cycle sizes will always remain the same, the total number of dots in the set. Imagine starting from the solved state, every element is in a 1 cycle. A 2 cycle can be created with 1 swap, so I'm going to say it has 1 chunk of entropy. That unit is kind of meaningless, so I gave it a dumb name. I feel like I didn't give a good explanation as to what a chunk of entropy actually is. So here's what it is. It's the minimum number of swaps you'd need to return a permutation to the solved state, which is like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 in order. So if you had the permutation 1, 2, 3, 5, 4, it would take one swap of the 5 and 4 to solve it into 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So that permutation has one chunk of entropy, and so on. A three cycle can be created with one swap and then another swap. So it has two chunks of entropy. To create this example, which is a four cycle of A going to B going to C going to D, First, swap A and B, then swap B and C, and finally swap C and D. So every 4 cycle can be created with 3 swaps, meaning they have 3 chunks of entropy. More generally, any n cycle has n-1 chunks of entropy. A 1 cycle clearly has 0 chunks of entropy. When you're faced with a bunch of cycles, how can you calculate how many chunks of entropy you've got? You could just add up the chunks of entropy for each group, but there's a faster way. You know how many elements you've got, in this case, 10. So you know the sum of cycle sizes is 10. And for every cycle, there's one fewer chunks of entropy than the cycle size. So with three cycles, we subtract three to find that there are seven chunks of entropy. More generally, any set of n elements and q cycles has n minus q chunks of entropy. This is true even when there are only one cycles, aka the solved state. Next, let's think about what each swap does. Before the swap, the two elements are always in cycles. They might be in cycles of size 1, but they're still cycles. If the two elements are in different cycles to start with, swapping them combines them into the same cycle, 
whose size is the sum of the previous two cycles. If the two elements start out in the same cycle, swapping them splits the cycle into two smaller cycles, whose combined size equals the size of their parent. Every time we do a swap, our cycle count either goes up by one or goes down by one. We know the number of chunks of entropy is element count minus cycle count, so the number of chunks of entropy also goes up by one or down by one. Every swap will do this, no matter what. To reach a permutation is to start out with the solved state, aka only one cycles, which has zero chunks of entropy, and apply swaps until we've reached our goal permutation. We already know how many chunks of entropy our goal permutation must have. For example, it might be 6. If every swap raises or lowers our chunks of entropy by 1, we'll definitely need an even number of swaps to get from 0 up to 6, right? That's always true, there's no way around it. Likewise, if the goal permutation's number of elements is odd, we need an odd number of swaps to get to our goal. It doesn't matter how many swaps we do, we could even do a million and one, but when we finally reach our destination, an odd number of swaps will have happened. The number of chunks of entropy actually tells you the minimum number of swaps necessary to get to your desired permutation. Dilly-dallying along the way always increases this count by a multiple of two, keeping the parity the same. Finally, how is this related to speed cubing? Okay guys, I'm gonna be honest, after this point of the video, the audio keeps going, but there's no more visuals, so oh well. When you make a turn on a 3x3, you're doing two 4 cycles, one for the edges and one for the corners. That's 6 chunks of entropy, which you can think of as 6 swaps happening simultaneously. 6 is even, which means that if you start from the solved state and do any sequence of moves, each move will be a sequence of 6 swaps that each increase or decrease the chunks of entropy by 1. Since 6 is even, your result will always be even, meaning you will never be left with a state like this, a single swap. 1 is odd. That's why, when you end up with that case on a 4x4, while simulating a 3x3, you must use moves otherwise not available on a 3x3 to get back to the solved state. No sequence of 3x3 moves will let you make the leap from the realm of odd chunks of entropy to the realm of even chunks of entropy. But how is the 4x4 able to reach those parity states? Well, watch what happens when we do a slice turn on a 4x4. When we do a slice turn, we perform a 4 cycle among the wing pieces, that's plus 3 entropy. We also do a 4 cycle among the clockwise centers, plus 3 entropy, and a 4 cycle among the counterclockwise centers, plus 3 entropy. In total, that's 9 chunks of entropy, which is odd. So doing a slice turn on a 4x4, we can access states of opposite parity from where we started. That's why it's possible to construct a wing parity algorithm for 4x4 that swaps just two wing pieces and leaves the rest intact. It requires switching the parity from even to odd, but that's possible if we do an odd number of slice turns, and odd times odd equals odd. That's all I've got to say. I can't decide what to do with this video now. Should I show it to my classmates and or instructors? I'm kind of scared that everything I said is wrong, but I feel like the way they're teaching it right now might not be the easiest for everyone. We'll see what happens.